However, in the absence of an opposition or in the absence of a strong opposition, is there a system where there, is, where there can be checks and balances within the government, where the government itself has within itself oppositions, where it can always check its actions? Is that sort of system, will that sort of system work here in Sri Lanka? Well, it did. It used to. I mean, um, you go back in time, far back, um, long before you were born. In 6570, uh, when you had the administration of Mr. Dudley Sananayake, you had a big policy clash between Mr. Dudley Sananayake on the one side and Mr. Jaya Jawadana on the other. Mr. Jaya Jawadana came up with the new ideas, not all of them right, but new ideas which helped him win the election in 77. So there was already an opposition within the government. It was well known. Mr. Dali Sanayaka was a more democratic and liberal person. But still. Then in um, the period 70-77, Mrs. Banaraka's administration, there were uh, there was opposition, there were different caucuses within. Most importantly, when Mr. Jawadana became president, President, uh, Prime Minister Premadasa ran his own show. I mean, he didn't have much power. Later, he said he had only the power of a peon. But what he did with that, with the peon's power, he stretched it. You know, he even had his own color. You see, bridges which are painted orange. Orange was Premadasa's color. While he was under Jajavadan with all these uh, MPs, ministers, bearing down on him, he did his own thing. Uh, when the JVP was banned in 1984, he wrote to President Jawadana objecting to the unfair ban on the JVP. He asserted himself as the opposition within the government. So therefore, when the government became extremely unpopular in 1988, who won the candidacy and who won the election? Premadasa, who was the opposition within the government. Um, Chandrika did the same thing. Within the SLFP, she was the opposition to her own mother. Madam Sri Mahabharanaka was the long-standing leader of the SLFP. Chandrika came back in and challenged her and took over and took the SLFP in uh, the correct direction, new direction. Under President Chandrika Kumarutunga, the government had an opposition. Who was that? Mr. Mahindra Rajapaksa. I mean, everyone who couldn't, uh, who had some problem, they rallied round Mahindra. At that time, he was the most popular uh, minister. Uh, he was the guy that the trade unions talked to, the fishermen talked to. Do you see anyone like that in the current government? Well, there are people with potential. Um, my Tripala Sirisena sounds right to me. He sounds like I remember Mahindra Rajapaksa in the 90s. Uh, but now, unlike at any time before, there is not just a glass ceiling, Mahindra. There's a a steel ceiling and these guys are trapped which is bad for the SLFP because the SLFP needs um, Maitri Pala Sirisena sounds good, Vidura Vikramasinghe sounds good, all the people I've seen so far those two people sound good to me uh, and they could be the future of the SLFP. Uh, the Asir is back in the SLFP now, he's another. Um, so there are people, the SLFP has potential but uh, there's a kind of a fear factor as well, and there's a kind of a kind of a clan or tribal ceiling which they can't break through. But there was the same problem with the Banaranaik as Mr. Rajapaksa broke through. It can be done. But there again, if you have a strong opposition, it helps, helps in the dissent within the government. So then the people have more than one democratic, credible alternative. Right now, we don't. And that is a sad thing. Despite the sacrifices of the people of Gampaha, uh, that has not yet leveraged the change either in government or, which would be easy to do, in the opposition leadership. Mm -hmm. And I hope that happens. Doctor, we usually in our show we also speak about not just uh, problems pertaining to the country or the political environment of Sri Lanka, we also speak about uh, the international arena yeah. and uh, we focus on certain countries yes. that have made the headlines. And the a country that has made the headlines these days is Australia, where we see elections coming up. And Australia is a country that obviously Sri Lanka has close ties with for 
let's say not so good reasons because we see a lot of asylum seekers from Sri Lanka going by boats then you know having to be victims of certain tragedies and now we see Australia coming up with an RRA uh, where it has uh, struck an agreement with uh, Papua New, G New Guinea uh, to send all asylum seekers to PNG for processing and now we see that an election date has been set 7th of September has been set as the day where Australia goes to poll how do you see the two candidates? We have Kevin Rudd on one side and we have Tony Abbott on the other. How do you think these two candidates um, would really play? I'm talking about also t talking about Sri Lanka in mind. Well, you know, I, I've got to be I've got to be very, very open about this. I've been a big fan of Kevin Rudd for a long time. We went, uh, we did our postgraduate studies at the same university, Griffith University, Brisbane. His daughter also went there. He's also a political science guy who's interested in the same things that I'm interested in, the ethics of violence. He's written, he's a real intellectual. And he's also a foreign policy guy, Kevin Rudd. And when, uh, at the time I predicted he was going to make it, he did, then he lost it, and then he's made it again. Uh, he's a China hand, he speaks Chinese. Relations between Sri Lanka and Australia are very good. They're not taking the anti-Sri Lankan line that many have taken. The high commissioners have been very good. So um, I, I really think it'll be good for Australia. Australia-Sri Lanka relations and for Australia's relationship with Asia, it's a very important player in the Asia-Pacific region for uh, Kevin Rudd to win. I mean, he, he's a kind of an Obama, he's a clever, he's an intellectual, he's a young man, he speaks well uh, and I think he's very good for Australia. I think he's a great country and I think they deserve, they deserve Kevin Rudd. I mean, but then who am I? I may be wrong, uh, but as a kind of a temporary Queenslander and a Griffith University alumni uh, and a foreign policy guy and a political scientist, I'm, uh, I'm rooting for Rudd on well, September 7. Well, uh, the one of the decisions that he's recently taken was, as I said, the RRA, but he's come under fire for that decision for sending all asylum seekers for processing at PNG. What can he do? It's, it's less tough than what Tony Abbott would do. I mean, Tony Abbott would be, I mean, the conservative, well, the liberal. They're, they're far uh, tougher than Labour. But and he's La actually said that if, if he is elected, he would make it a whole militarization process. Of course, it'll be far rougher on the asylum seekers. And my heart goes out to those people who are going there. But if you're the Prime Minister of Australia, I mean, you just can't allow yourself to be played for a sucker and open the place up to every, uh, you know, ex-LTT guy who wants to make money and uh, who wants to feed uh, kind of an anti-Sri Lankan um, constituency into Australia. You can't be played for suckers. So the Australians are doing the right thing. They're doing it in the most humane way under Kevin Rudd and earlier under Julia Gillard, I mean the Labour Party policy. It would be much tougher on the asylum seekers, on the traffickers really. Mm. Uh, under a liberal government, so I think uh, I think Rudd is good all around. Well, I I hope the Australian <laughs> voters think so. <laughs> well, you said it, they're doing it in the most humane way yeah. possible, but the United Nations Refugee uh, Agency has said that uh, the decision to send asylum seekers to PNG it says that PNG does not have the necessary That's facilities; true. it is not equipped yeah. to process such large large number of uh, asylum seekers that come from various countries like Sri Lanka, Iran, Afghanistan, uh, who come in boatloads uh, to Australia, that they're not really equipped to handle these asylum seekers, nor do they have the relevant facilities there. So can this be argued that it is not a human um, sort of decision, but a decision that is being done because of helplessness? It is because of helplessness, but it's not like there are, you know, huge massacres going on and therefore people are fleeing and countries should open its borders. Uh, no country really does so unless there are exceptional circumstances. And Australia obviously does not want to do so. Australia has been very generous uh, in, its, in its policies. Uh, interestingly, the most educated and successful component of the migrant communities in Australia are the Sri Lankans. Um, you know, they're doing very well. Australia is a wonderful place. I've lived there. Um, some people want to know why I didn't stay on, but I never did. I never applied for PR or anything. I did, just did my PhD and came back. But it's a great place and they've been as open as possible. Um, 
you can't expect them to just allow a flood. Where will it stop? The thing is to build up the facilities in Papua New Guinea and whoever is willing to take them. Then it will also dissuade those who want to come. If they think they're going to wind up Aussie citizens, they're more likely to come. This way they'll stay back and maybe work for change in their societies. I mean, even the Sri Lankans, they can work for change here rather than, you know, risk their lives uh, making that boat trip. So I think uh, Kevin Rudd is trying to do something difficult, but I wish him luck. All right. Thank you very much, Doctor, for joining us on another episode of Vantage Point. Uh, thank you, everyone at home, for watching us. We'll see you again in a fortnight with more insight, intellectual insight into stories making headlines here in Sri Lanka and around the world.